last night, the Minneapolis Miracle game was on Fox Sports 1, and all of Vikings Twitter uh, in my timeline was watching the game back all at once. And it reminded me of so many things, a flood of memories coming back. And I thought, you know what, Judd, look outside right now. It's gray. It's ugly. It was snowing. We need to spend a good portion of time here on today's show talking about the Minneapolis Miracle because you, love and, it. you and I were both there. Yep. And there were so many darn things that happened in that game that are so memorable for some of them and then others that sort of get lost. And then when you bring them up or when you watch it again, you go, that's right. I forgot about that. Yep. And I, I wanted to ask you, cause you were tweeting about it last night where you want to start. I want to go with the things <laughs> that get forgotten about that game yep. that are kind of great or notable or interesting um, that stick out to us. So where do you want to start? I want to start with, with a statement. And that statement is how was this not the Vikings version of, of 41 donut the opposite in watching that first quarter the saints look awful yep breeze is not good i, I believe he was old for his first six and i think pass number six was actually a nice uh pick by andrew sandejo the vikings are dominant absolutely dominant 17 nothing and it could have been an easily um should have been 21 rip so i want to start with that statement of of when you consider a tale of two halves and with where that game started and that building going crazy and the saints looking absolutely lost. It is amazing that the second half of that game shifted that completely. And, and as a sports fan, preferable game. So like if the Vikings win 35 to nothing or something as a sports fan, not that much fun as a Vikings fan. It's great. So I'm not complaining, but I am amazed in seeing that unfold again, that that did not become, because it certainly could have been a complete route, Matthew. Oh, it most certainly could have been. Uh, and when, at that point, when you and I are sitting there and Latavius Murray scores a one yard touchdown to make it 17, nothing, I'm saying, I can't believe the saints right now. The saints were unbelievable in the regular season. And breeze had just had another incredible year He's driving to uh, down the field and then he throws the pick where I think it's tipped or he's pressured and it just doesn't look anything like Drew Brees in any way, shape or form. And when they get up 17 to nothing, th there was a feeling that, like you said, it was going to be a route and they went into halftime at 17, nothing. But I also remember having a conversation with you saying this is not over because if I'm not mistaken, the Saints got the ball back ha at after halftime. Or something like that. Or okay. they were, they might have been getting the ball back I've got or the game whatever book it was. For this and conversation. We okay. were saying, okay, this thing, this thing is in really good shape for the Vikings, but this is not over because of who plays for the other team. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know exactly who got the ball uh in the second start, half there. The third quarter? In the third quarter. But the Vikings didn't punt it. But the Saints score the next touchdown. Yes. And that comes off of the Case Keenum interception, correct? And that's where things start to start to swing is Keenum throws the pick mm -hmm. and I, I've got to get my order, right? I've got to get the box score up here, but Keenum throwing the pick. What was really interesting about that was all year long, Mike Zimmer had talked about in the media, <laughs> yes. the risky throws that yes. case Keenum made that. I mean, I can think of a dozen of them right off the top of my head. There was one in Detroit where Keenum rolled out and rolled out and rolled out and held the ball for about 10 seconds yep. before finally throwing it. And I think Adam Thielen or Kyle Rudolph jumped up and made the catch. There's another one in Los Angeles where someone asked Keenum, did you know where Thielen was when you threw it? Oh, of course I did. Of course I saw him. No, clue. no you didn't. <laughs> we, went back, we went back and looked at the tape like, Unless he's got eyeballs that are like, um, you know, on on a crane or something. Yep. There's no way he could have seen him. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you where where I thought the door is still open is Forbath actually misses a field goal before half that could have made it a 20 point game. Mm -hmm. And when he misses that because Keenum took a bad sack, mm -hmm. I had this feeling of all right, well, the Saints are still in this game and we've got a long time to go. And then when Keenum throws that interception, you end up with the blocked punt and then everything starts rolling for there. Uh, a few things that I remembered from last night that I had not thought of in a long time. One was the injury to Nick Easton 
was something that we were all very concerned about. In Green Bay. Which sounds funny now, but he goes out and that just reshuffled the offensive line completely. And to your credit, when when Easton got hurt in that game around Christmas, right? Yeah. At Lambeau yep, Field. Yep. You and I were down you there. You looked yep. at me and said, this is really bad. And I thought to myself, really that bad? And you said, this is not good. And it was immediately be became a debate because there were certain folks who said, ah, Nicky, ah, it's not that big of a deal. And you were like adamant that this w was going to be a big deal. And then if I'm not mistaken, Matthew Collar, they moved Remmers off of that, right? They did. And, they, and, and Remmers had had a decent year at right tackle had, and they and, moved him inside. And that actually, I think in some ways compounded it because he was what I would describe as a competent right tackle. The ask to play guard that suddenly threw him off a bit. Yes. And even when he had a whole off season to play guard the following year, he couldn't play guard. He yeah. just was not a guard. He had never done it in his life. And so he was moved over there. That was a disastrous game for him. Rashad Hill was thrown in at right tackle. At that point, Rashad Hill had barely played in the NFL. Mm -hmm. He, I think, started in Detroit, and there might have been a couple of games where Remmers got hurt and he went in and played. But aside from that, the guy had barely ever played. He was a practice squad player for Jacksonville, undrafted, and now in a playoff game, he's got to play Cameron Jordan. And I remember going back and looking at it and saying, Jordan demolished him a few times. But give that guy some credit for not giving up like five sacks. I mean, it was amazing that they made that decision because they had Jeremiah Searles, our buddy, on the roster, and he could play any position. So why they didn't have Searles go in and play guard, I will never it's really understand. And it hurt them big time in Philadelphia. I'll give you another thing that came right to mind, too, and then we can dive deeper into um, the second half quarterback play of Drew Brees. Mm -hmm. But the punter becoming a folk hero was one of the coolest things to come from that. Thomas Morstead. Did you remember though? And I didn't. So, so he got hurt on his first punt. Cheryl's is breaking away. And Morstead basically, I think saved a potential yep. touchdown. Yes. Yep. I don't recall from the press box being nearly as aware as I was last night in watching the replay though. He immediately grabbed his rib and, yeah. bro and broke his rib. Right. Yeah. Yep. But, and then every punt, he would punt and grab his wrist. Yes, I do remember. I yeah. didn't recall him yep. being hurt that that bad uh, until well after the because fact. Because he punted and, well. Yeah, and watching it last night, though, again, for the first time, that takes some real guts, literally, to keep punting with a broken rib. And it was one of the cooler things that after that, Morstead, a lot of people started donating money yep. to his foundation, and then I believe he came up to Minnesota and gave all the money to the, the, the... Yeah, that's right. And the, he um, came back on the field. He he was one of about, what, eight guys yeah. that came from the locker room back on the field for the two-point conversion where Case kneeled down. Yes, and I think he was playing like defensive end or something. He was, he was yeah. lined up as defensive end. You're right. But that, that was the gutsiest performance that you will ever see out of a punter. Okay, so second half, though. We got to talk about Drew Brees in the second half. Yes. Because I saw someone tweet me last night that that quarterback play in the second half was about as good as it, you'll ever see in your life. And I don't know about you because you covered Brett Favre and th that's a, a different level of quarterback. And my previous experience was in Buffalo. Yeah. So we have different level of quarterback play that we've covered in our journalistic careers. But I've never seen a quarterback in front of my eyes play better than Drew Brees did in the second half of that game. True. Let me ask you this, though. What do we think? Because Brees was fantastic. And Brees deserves, if there's credit to be doled out for the Saints' second half comeback against the Vikings in the Minneapolis Miracle, let's say uh, Brees deserves 75%. But what did Sean Payton find? That's the one thing. Hmm. Because Sean Payton, to be clear, I think he's a jerk. I don't think he's a good guy, all right? But offensively, he's incredibly smart. And he's been doing this a, a long time. And that first half performance by Zim's defense, Matthew, was so dominant at times and so good. And that place was deafening. And the Saints look lost that I can't help but give Peyton and the offensive staff as well some of the credit for clearly making adjustments that allowed Breeze to get in a rhythm to find some of that success. That is true. I'll tell you where it might have turned to some extent was when Andrew Sandejo got hurt. 
So he gets knocked out on a block or something. Michael I, I don't Thomas. remember exactly what it was. It Michael was Thomas, Thomas blocked him. It, it was with been. Thomas. And I think Sandejo was being Sandejo too. Yeah. And so he gets hurt. Mm -hmm. Then things have to shuffle around. Now, Anthony Harris comes in the game yep. and ends up getting the third down and one stop, which we'll talk about in a second. But uh, that changed everything, not only from the fact that Sandejo had been the starter all year long and they had had no injuries, but also because Xavier Rhodes was really upset. He was throwing his helmet. He was freaking out. He was extremely Your guy, Terrence, angry. clearly pulled him aside and said, stop it, knock it off. But Peyton and Drew Brees saw that. Yes. And the very next play, they went right against him and threw a touchdown. True. That was a big part of it. Um, I, th I think the other part was just Brees not being shaken, even one tiny little percentage point that they got to on the drive where they kicked the, the field goal. Mm -hmm. They get to fourth down and... 12 or something. I mean, it, it's, yes, it's, it's a great, it's a play. bad situation. And yep. they knew exactly who to attack at that moment. They went after Mackenzie Alexander on that play. Uh -huh. And Alexander now is a pretty good player. But at that point, he was completely unproven. And it was just a rotational player with Terrence Newman. He's on the field. I'm not sure exactly why he's on the field there. And they go after him. Maybe they had a dime package. In, I don't remember. But he's on the field there. Mm -hmm. And they go after him and hit Willie Sneed. And it's one of the best passes in the most clutch, calm quarterback throws ever. I mean, the, the, the noise it's in that place. That play, yeah, yeah, fourth and ten. The noise in that place at that point is every bit as loud as it was when I was in New Orleans last year. Yep. Uh, on the the final drive by the Vikings where the crowd is trying to you know intimidate the Vikings offense. And that throw is incredible. And the one that gets left behind is he also threw a touchdown to Elvin Kamara over Eric Kendricks, yep. where Kendricks's coverage is so perfect. And he drops it right in there to Elvin Kamara I mean, breeze right there. Not that I was ever like doubting Drew right. breeze, right. but I just went, I am in awe of what you are doing in front of me. And it can't be forgotten that Sean Payton had Willie Sneed throw a pass amidst all of that. Yes. He had his wide receiver throw a pass as Breeze is on fire and shredding the Vikings And that's what defense. I'm saying is, Pey is Peyton had guts or has guts. Oh, yes. Peyton has guts. Yes, for sure. Uh, I also forgot, and Joe Buck accidentally gave this guy credit for the block punt before he realized he was wrong. But part of the key to the block punt that Quigley had, at least from the pressure standpoint, was Taysom Hill. Oh, I didn't and, remember. And that. I forgot. And Buck's like, yeah, this, this Taysom Hill is a pretty good player. And Sean Payton's convinced that he can someday be a starting quarterback. And I had forgotten that Taysom Hill even played in that game. Yeah, uh, that's right. Because he was a special teamer at that point. He the pressure on him. Uh, speaking of that particular play, that is my favorite of the entire game. Because <laughs> the that's overball. the same night, the <laughs> same night in Green Bay that Nick Easton got hurt. Cronin. Kevin McDermott got hurt yes, as well. And the backup long snapper from Alaska that they brought in forgot to go left or right, whichever he was supposed to do, yep. went the wrong way. Yep. And that's what ended up leading to the block punt. And Mike Prefer that week said he'd never seen it before. Never, ever seen a long snapper go the wrong way. Because my understanding of the language is it's something like, red is right. Yep. And I don't know, lollipop is left. I mean, it's just like, you can't mess this up. And he ends up going the wrong way. And that ends up kind of getting the ball rolling to this. A few other things from just watching it. Um, Adam Thielen, his mm -hmm. catch where he breaks his back mm -hmm. is truly unbelievable. And they had Marshawn Lattimore on him that night. Mm -hmm. That was an interesting choice to put Lattimore, who was at the top of his game as a rookie on Thielen and Thielen still smoked him on a couple plays. And there was a fade pass that Keenum threw to him where he, I believe, got interfered on and still went Which up quarter? over his Do shoulder. I, I want to say that it was in the fourth quarter. Yes. Where Keenum I saw threw it. the fade over his shoulder. And by, by the way, that's a pass I can guarantee you that Kirk Cousins will, would not throw. I agree. That's a Keenum special. And I, I also can guarantee you as great as that pass play was and, and the fact that Thielen who I believe, so if I'm correct on the play that we're talking about, if it's the same play, they threw two flags. Thielen was held. Yes. Something else drew a flag, and Thielen had no chance to catch the ball. He catches the ball, and I guarantee you that Zim bristled about it because it was a throw yeah, that was, it was just heaving it up. Yep. It was incredibly dicey. Yep. But they threw not one but two flags, and Thielen still caught the ball. Yeah. So, that I mean, he gets left behind in this because Diggs becomes the star. And Diggs had an amazing game, too. 
Uh, he had before that he had five catches and a, a huge amount of yardage. So they both dominated in that game mm-hmm. as you hope that they would do. And, and as they did uh, that season all the time in that year, but Thielen getting hurt probably impacted them the following week at Philadelphia because he did break his back. Those two catches though, really stood out in my mind. And then the guy that you and I and the locker room praised over and over and over and over again. And then the Vikings got rid of, and this is a few, I think you're going this down, is yeah. a, a little bit of the postscript written in here already, but Jerry is right. A 27 yard catch on, I think third down. And if it's not third down, it's still an amazing play. It's a big time throw yep. and a big time catch for a guy who always knew how to get open in the right spot. And I remember looking at this, something like 14 of his 17 catches were on third down that year. And he just made a huge play at a huge time that ended up setting up the Kai Forbath field goal mm-hmm. that you and I are still in amazement of with the Forbath field goal. The four, yes. Well, the Forbath thing, that actually, I, I think... Uh, of all the things that I went back and watched last night and thought about, I think the four bath one might amaze me the most. This guy makes a 53 yard field goal in a time where the script for every Vikings kicker, if there's a script, a playoff script, right? It says you miss wide left. He also had a 49 yard in the same. Game. Yes. But, but the script does say that, right? Gary Anderson, yep. Blair Walsh, the script says you don't make this. And Kai, Forbath, who, yes, had some struggles at times on PATs, I understand that, comes in and, as you just said, makes two field goals, including a crucial 53-yarder that saved the day and could have actually, if the defense had stopped the Saints going back down the field, have been the game-winning points. And you decide to get cute and go with a rookie draft pick. What's amazing about Kai Forbath is for Washington in his career, he made 60 of 69, which is 87% field goals. Mm -hmm. And then as a Viking, 47 of 53. Last year as a Dallas Cowboy, 10 for 10. All time, he's 87%. And they just move on from the guy after he hit that field goal and draft another kicker who supposedly had a bigger leg. Well, how much farther are you kicking it than 53 would be my question. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> I mean, if, the, yeah. if this guy can make a 53-yard field goal in that situation, and that ultimately cost them a game and cost them making the playoffs the following year because they decided to move on from somebody who had been as clutch as clutch can be in a spot where, at that point, there is a minute and 29 seconds left in that game. Yes. So then he makes the field right. goal. And immediately Drew Brees goes to work and Mm -hmm. he hits the fourth and 10. It sets them up. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'll forever question Sean Payton is they've got third down and one. They get one yard. The game is over. Mm -hmm. There is a saying that I've had on Twitter for years now, and I guess I'll have to change it because Linval is gone, but I'll always tweet. Why would you run the ball at Linval Joseph on third or fourth and one? I looked at the numbers using Pro football reference, the Vikings on third or fourth and one best team in the NFL since Zimmer came into the league. And it's not even close. It's by a lot. And that, and that year you couldn't run on. And and Linval was legit a defensive MVP caliber player that year. That's the best year of his career. Nothing else is even close. And you run it up the middle. Anthony Harris hits a gap, stops the runner. And I just, why would you not have Drew Brees, a guy who I know he threw picks in this game, but just never threw picks and would throw the ball away if there was any problem? You know that Brees isn't going to do something stupid. He's Drew Brees. Right. And you decide you're going to run at the most dominant player on the Vikings defense. It just there were a few things where you went. This stadium does stuff to people's brains. I don't know what it is, but other coaches, the dome they did the choke, same thing. They do weird things. They and make why not, crazy mistakes. In retrospect, wh- why not just have Breeze attempt to dump the ball off to Kamara? Right. Yeah. A screen pass. Yeah. And, and then if it's not there, he just throws it away or a, a slant to uh, Michael Thomas. And if it's covered, you just throw it in the dirt or whatever. You, you have all sorts of options there and you decide you're going to stuff it up the middle and they shut it down. And after the game in the locker room, I, I had this clever plan. Like I'm going to write about that play because that's the forgotten play. And every player I tried to ask, they're like, I don't know. I don't know what just happened. I can't well, talk yeah, about that. Not, yeah. I don't know anything. Yeah. So, so I didn't end up writing the story, but I have thought about that a lot of that mistake of trying to hammer the ball up the middle and taking it out of the hands of your best player. Yep. Sort of in a way, a similar mistake to not giving it to Marshawn. Like if you're not giving the ball to the best player at the right time, right. what are you doing? But 
the amazing thing about this entire conversation is the amount of action and and lead changes and all of those things that took place in a final 301 yes. in watching yes. it it's still hard to get my head around even knowing this now matthew yes. that they're going to that the saints are going to get the ball back and they're going to drive and then the vikings are going to get the at some point in time just from a clock standpoint mentally it stops making sense it reminded me of the super bowl with arizona and pittsburgh where the first half of the game you're like Okay, I guess Pittsburgh's winning a Super Bowl. Who cares? And then the the final two or three minutes is so wild that you remember it as one of the best. Now, the play, mm -hmm. this is where I started writing as soon as they got the ball back. I started writing a column, Case Keenum leads the Vikings to a magical victory because my thought process was if he doesn't, no one's reading this anyway. Vikings fans are going to be so mad after going 13 and three and losing a playoff game at home in grand fashion, blowing a 17 point. They're <laughs> yes. going to be so mad. Yes. Everyone's going to bed immediately. Nobody is reading my article. So I started or writing. Drinking. I started writing about his game and how there was the big comeback. And then, you know, Keenum leads the, the victory. And there's a couple of throws that kind of go nowhere. Yep. And as soon as he lets that one go, I saw Marcus Williams coming over there. And my thought was, oh my gosh, Kai is going to have to kick like a 60 yard field goal. Cause I thought he was going to catch it and get tackled. And that was it. And as soon as he goes flying by yes, that place was the loudest I've ever heard in any game I've ever covered. I mean, just like an explosion. Where block. does that rank to in your uh, career, either in this business or just as a fan going to games? Where does that rank as far as you being absolutely shocked in the split second that you say to yourself, there's no one there? Because I just remember yeah. looking yep. – because there's supposed to be somebody there. Yes, yeah. Like if you're Stefan Diggs, in your brain, there had to be that split second of what? Yeah, yes. And then he took off. Yep, exactly. And I think it was even for him too when he went flying by of, oh my gosh, I've, I've got to run this. Because their whole thing on the sideline was get out of bounds, make a catch, get out of bounds, set up a field goal. And, you know, of course, if you've got – the entire open air, you've got to jog into the end zone. Right. Uh, but no, there was definitely that moment when he went flying by where it, the whole place explodes because everyone all at the same exact second realizes there's no one there. And oddly enough, the same thing happened in New Orleans on Delvin Cook's fumble that was not a fumble where it was the same reaction for me. I just went, I can't believe this. I, the, and I probably even said it out loud and no one would have heard me because the, right. the place was so loud. So then. He scores the touchdown. He throws his helmet. And I'm thinking, are they going to penalize and him? And they for, did. Yeah, the the they, official right, throws did. the flag. Yeah. And it just didn't matter. And then right. quietly goes and picks it up. Yeah, that's right. He throws what, the flag. What, what would be the penalty there? Would you, it would be maybe assessed on the extra point that never happened. Yeah. So it wouldn't have mattered anyway. No, no. Or the kick assessed on the kickoff that never happened. No, the play, the yeah. play at that point is dead. The problem was the practice squad player who was so yes. excited he went on the yes. field Caleb as the Jones. Play. That could that would have been the problem. If Caleb That's Jones That's not a dead play at that point. If he had left the field and I don't know it's possible he did this. If he had left the sideline and gone onto the field before Diggs scored, you might have been able to say that they had broken the rules and that would be a penalty. Correct. Uh, but he runs out he grabs Stefan Diggs and then in the locker room Certainly nothing like I've ever seen before. Just all sorts of people crying. Uh, B-Rob has his kid on his lap and he's just in tears. And But my favorite part is Harrison Smith because I went over to Harrison Smith and it's just, Harrison, this is crazy. What's your reaction? Well, you know, we, we won. That's great. But we got a game next week. I was like, are you kidding me, Harrison? Hitman is at that point really got to like, okay. Hitman is the perfect name for you because the craziest bleep ever just happened out there for any of us that any of us have ever seen. And you're like, well, you know, we got to go on and play the Eagles. So yeah, he wasn't wrong. No, he was and not. They, and he was right about them not being prepared for that. He certainly was. Do you, uh, in, in terms of the postscript for the Minneapolis miracle, do you buy that they were so emotionally drained after that, that they couldn't play in Philadelphia? I never have. I've never liked that. I've never liked when they've said it. We had a bad week of practice and everything else. Every team who has one of those wins loses the next week. You were up seven, nothing in the Philly game and you had your chances and it just, and you got out schemed and you got outplayed. I never really liked that as an explanation for what happened. I believe that in the second half of that game, the saints definitely exposed some things that Doug Peterson and the Eagles picked up on and exposed as well. 
You know, it's weird. It's weird to say because I'm not a big fan of this guy, but you're probably right. Sandejo being hurt. Uh, and they played the, him. The yeah, next and week, he, but that he, was but, a huge mistake. But he was a shell yep. of himself by that point in yep. time. Um, there were. It, it's funny if you do go back and watch that game now, Matthew. There were real telltale signs, though, of problems that, in the excitement and the immediate aftermath of that game, you probably just didn't think about or you buried. Yeah. But now, three years or so after the fact, when you watch that game back, because that first half they just owned it. Yep. They just completely, and then they it started to disintegrate and fall apart. And and what I'm trying to think of is, is that the first game when we did get what trended to become the new Xavier Rhodes, which is he got hurt in that game. Yep. yep. He was really mad about the Sandejo play. Uh, and he, then he was never the same after that. No. And then that yep. sort, but that sort of became him, right? Yep. Get hurt once a game, meltdown probably once a month. Yep. And as I recall, unless I'm wrong here. That was the first game where you said to yourself, what's going on with 29? Because yeah. he's ordinarily not like this. Yep. And then he became like that. Definitely. But he yeah, I like think that. it was a multitude of things. And I do think that there were definitely there were definite areas of that team that were exposed in the final two quarters by the Saints that the Eagles were smart enough to probably pick up on. And that's what's hard for Vikings fans, I'm sure, about watching that game back is it represented the absolute peak of the mountain of the Mike Zimmer era. But there was another side of the mountain. I mean, that after that, a lot of the things, I mean, even whether it's the kicking thing or whether it's Pat Shermer leaving because of it or an, a number of different things, not sticking with Case Keenum because you thought he was going to fall apart. Uh, there was the Teddy Bridgewater thing where they wanted to toll his contract and he didn't want to do that. Still a weird and one, yeah. it, it, like so much happened after that that took you down the other side that you haven't reached the other side that the bottom of the mountain, of course, this team just went 10 and six, but it was more of, yet you're probably never going to get there again after that. And, and what happened in Philadelphia really did represent the start of the decline. What happens if they lose that Saints game? I still think that history plays out pretty much the same. I think that they signed Kirk Cousins and I think they have the same problems as they did. I I mean Mike Zimmer is keeping his job still. You went 13 and 3. You're yeah. not getting fired. I don't know how much It's a brutal loss. is different. Yeah, it's Oh yeah, you blow a 17 point lead. It's not good, but you're not firing the coach. Yeah. So, I, I agree. 